Jerusalem Dateline. This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Israeli President Reuven Rivlin chooses Yair Lapid to form the next government. Can he succeed with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu fail? Plus, in an exclusive interview, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo addresses the threat of a nuclear Iran and praying for Muslims during their holy month of Ramadan. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israeli President Reuven Rivlin picked Yair Lapid to form the next coalition government. If Lapid succeeds, it could mark the beginning of the end of the Netanyahu era. President Rivlin gave the mandate to Lapid, hoping that Israel can emerge from a political stalemate that's led to four elections within two years. Lapid told Israelis the country needs a unity government. Israel, I found Israel is tired of fighting. The Israeli society is looking to its politicians and asking them when will they stop arguing and start working. Now we need a unity government. Lapid leads the center-left Yeshatid party, Hebrew for there is a future. The majority of his support comes from secular Israelis, many who oppose ultra-Orthodox policies. A former TV journalist, Lapid supports negotiations with the Palestinian Authority while drawing the line on an undivided Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the ethos this country was established by. And you don't, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't think Americans will, for any kind of agreement, will give up the Capitol Hill. And I don't think Israelis should give up their own capital. Lapid faces a daunting challenge of unifying parties across the political spectrum, including an Arab party of the so-called change bloc, which primarily seeks to oust Prime Minister Netanyahu. Because there's such a push to replace Netanyahu, um, there does seem to be a feeling that uh, these parties may agree to what they can agree on and uh, whatever they can agree on to leave out on the side. For weeks, Lapid has been negotiating with so-called kingmaker Naftali Bennett from Yamina, a religious Zionist party. Bennett's support is crucial and Lapid has offered a power-sharing agreement where the two would take turns as prime minister, with Bennett going first. A Bennett partnership would include a conservative foreign and domestic policy agenda, which he explained in our exclusive CBN News interview prior to the last election. The country is 72 years old. We continue to be threatened by, uh, you know, some of the worst countries in the world. Let's cut taxes, cut bureaucracy, speed up the economy in a Reaganesque uh, uh, way. Like Lapid, Bennett opposes the Iranian nuclear agreement, calling it a terrible deal. The deal, in fact, allows Iran to proceed to the very verge of acquiring not one nuclear weapon, but dozens. All they need to do is press a button, and they'll have, within days, dozens of nuclear bombs. Bennett and Lapid claim they can form a government within a week. If so, they would mark a watershed moment in Israeli politics while pushing Netanyahu out of office and into the opposition. The prime minister has failed three times to form a government, and his latest effort expired on Tuesday, leading President Rivlin to choose Lapid. Trayman sees twin threats of increased Palestinian terrorism and a potential nuclear Iran facing a Lapid-Bennett government. The question is whether an inexperienced prime minister can deal with these threats. Lapid has 28 days to form a government. If he fails, Rivlin could allow a three-week period when any Knesset member could try and cobble a coalition together. If that doesn't work, Israelis will head to the polls for the fifth time in just more than two years. Former U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo sat down with CBN founder Pat Robertson for an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview. In this first segment, they discussed the danger of a nuclear Iran and the great success of the Abraham Accords. It looks like the same thing with Iran. They, they are just threatening us in the Straits of Hormuz and these other places. And yet, um, are, we, are we able to take them on? I mean, uh, you know, like the, going back to that joint forces agreement with the nuclear weapons, I mean, if they get the nuclear bomb, it'll be a disaster. Yes, it'll be a disaster for us. It'll certainly be a total disaster for the 
Jewish people in yeah. Israel, and frankly, Christians and Arabs living in Israel, but the Jewish homeland of Israel, uh, right? The Iranians have demonstrated their genocidal intent with respect to Israel. Exactly. And we can never let them get a nuclear weapon. I, I remember, you'll appreciate this. We had some Iranian Coast Guard cutters come around one of our ships when we were, right. when right. we were first in. President Trump said, okay, um, if they come close again, take well, whatever yeah. action you need. Uh, we communicated that to the Iranians, that this was our policy, and we never had that problem again. We had it just a few a few days ago. And we just had it. it. They're testing President Biden. They're going to see if he has the same resolve that President Trump had and that our team had. Uh, I hope and pray that they do. Uh, because while they're in Vienna negotiating to hand back a whole bunch of money to the Iranians, mm -hmm. when the U.S. negotiators are willing to hand over everything, the Iranians are flying over our ships, approaching our cutters, enriching uranium at levels they have never enriched before. Mm -hmm. And our friends, our friends in Israel, frankly, our Arab state Gulf partners as well, yeah. who work with security issues, uh, they all see this, and they will be put in an incredibly difficult position. Well, you know, the, it's amazing. The uh, uh, Abraham Accords that you guys put together were just an incredible thing. Forty years of failed policy where yeah. right, the central premise was if you don't solve this problem between the Palestinians and Israel, yeah. then nothing can move forward. We, we said that's just crazy. Uh, and by the way, if we're wrong, so be it. We can't do any worse than y'all did. <laughs> and so, uh, so we took a completely different approach and began to build out. It took us almost four years to build out the uh, trust and confidence of those Arab leaders and frankly of Prime Minister Netanyahu as well. Uh, but once we did that, we got this glorious outcome, these Abraham Accords, which will change the nature of how ordinary citizens in the Middle East live for decades to come. It was absolutely brilliant. Well, now, do you think Saudis are going to come along? And will they, will they uh, sign a peace deal with Israel? I think they probably want to, don't they? I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think the Saudi people want to as well. I think that's always the thing that's most important. But it's harder if the American president isn't strong enough to stand behind and provide support to that. It, there's no doubt that President Trump as a leader, enabled those Abraham Accords to come together. It took great leaders oh, in Bahrain, yeah. in Emirates, and in Israel, but you needed America. You needed America to be there working and have confidence that the American Secretary of State would assist them in, in making it all go. I'm not sure that we have that under President Biden today. That may make it more difficult for the Saudis, but I am confident that this is a one-way ratchet, that this peace will continue to build. Part two of our interview with Secretary of State Pompeo the growing relationship between Iran and North Korea and the growing menace of Turkey. In part two of Pat Robertson's interview with Secretary Pompeo, they address the dangerous relationship between North Korea and Iran, the growing menace of Turkey, and what is happening around the world with the gospel. Well, are the Iranians getting a nuclear technology from North Korea? Is that, is, what, is that where they're getting it? There's a lot of work that goes into making sure that this, the risk of proliferation of these nuclear weapons from North Korea to Iran doesn't take place. And Iran, as a result of that, has chosen to, has chosen to try and build it out itself, yeah. try to make a homegrown system. But we do always worry that North Korea will transport a nuclear weapon somewhere. Could be to Iran, could be someplace else as well. Uh, when, you, when you have someone like Chairman Kim in possession of a nuclear weapon, it is a Terrible. very, very dangerous. You know, I noticed that uh, uh, Biden did something that I could sort of applaud. He finally uh, called the uh, slaughter of the Armenian Christians genocide, and we've been unwilling to do that to this time. Uh, Turkey and with Erdogan is sort of a difficult problem. and. Uh, how, how do you say, did, did, did he play that one right or not? So I actually agree. I, I always support good decisions. In this, ca in this case, <laughs> President Biden made a good decision. I, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to, to second his motion there. I'm, I'm glad that he did that. It was a long time coming, and he picked a historic moment to do it, so mm -hmm. good, good for their administration for having done that. Turkey's complicated. Uh, we ch we were very challenged there. It began with trying to free Pastor Brunson. Yes. So I my know. first mission in Turkey was that. We were fortunate. The Lord smiled upon us, and we got yeah. Pastor Brunson back home. But we were still challenged by a President Erdogan who has an understanding of the world where he denies religious freedom to his own people, mm -hmm. where he has this an idea about greater Turkish uh, empire building. Mm -hmm. It's most unfortunate. He's a member that Turkey is a member of NATO, and they have not acted consistent with their obligations to NATO. And so we pushed back on them pretty hard. We sanctioned them. 
we pulled an important weapon system out. They were building parts of our joint strike fighter. We pulled that program back from them. I hope Turkey will come to see that their, uh, their best path forward is to join with the West and not join with an Islamist understanding of the world. That won't serve the Turkish people well. Well, you know, it's uh, amazing that uh, he, that uh, Santa Sophia church, he decided oh, to make a mosque. It's so just, sad. Yeah, it's terrible. So sad. Not long after they did that, I traveled to Turkey and uh, met to support another faith leader, the ecumenical patriarch there. I had the chance to meet him in, in Istanbul, former Constantinople in Istanbul. Uh, it was glorious to be at the seat of the Greek Orthodox Church and to see those Christian believers in a very challenging place there in Turkey. What do you think? You know, it, it, I used to think that China would be the largest Christian nation on the face of the earth. We saw so many people coming to the Lord in China. It was overwhelming. And there seems to be a religious revival. Are you, are you heartened by the fact that there's so many people coming to the Lord? I mean, there really is a spiritual revival in the world. Yeah. Despite these things. I see it in yeah. so many places. I saw it in Africa. Yeah. I saw it in places in South America. I'm confident that that spirit is alive and well inside of China as well, in spite of the authoritarian regime that tries to push it away and denies the house mm -hmm. churches even the capacity to practice their faith. I am confident that the that Chinese people too will come to see the Lord in big numbers. Yeah. It'd be a glorious thing. I, I think all across the world, uh, God is touching hearts and changing lives. Mm. I'm an incredibly optimistic as a result of that. Well, you have such a distinguished career and we're so grateful for you being here. God bless you. God bless you too. Up next, a look at Israel's northern neighbor, Lebanon, why it's on the brink of collapse. As Lebanon teeters on the brink of economic collapse, Iran's proxy Hezbollah is poised to take over. But as CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl reports, it's not by military force. Providing the goods and services the country needs could make an Iranian dream come true. Lebanon is still suffering from the impact of this massive explosion that ripped through the Beirut port last August. The death and damage to the Lebanese capital has devastated an already floundering economy and could contribute to a potential takeover by the terror group Hezbollah. Lebanon is in a very, very dire straits. The political arena is dysfunctional. Therefore, the state practically is dysfunctional. There's no budget. The unemployment is 40, 50, 60 percent. Nobody really knows. Skyrocketing food prices, crippling fuel shortages, and widespread power outages. According to the World Bank, more than half the population now lives under the poverty line. Actually, the whole state sinks into a situation in which nothing works. People are losing hope. They don't know where to start fixing this situation. Lebanon's government resigned as a result of the blast, and since October, Prime Minister-designate Saad Hariri has failed to form a new government. In a recent visit to Lebanon, a U.S. State Department official called on Lebanese politicians to end the bickering. And those who continue to obstruct progress on the reform agenda jeopardize their relationship with the United States and our partners and open themselves up to punitive actions. And those who facilitate progress can be assured of our strong support. Decades ago, Lebanon was an international destination. Christians and Muslims got along, while Beirut became known as the Paris of the Middle East. Hariri wants a cabinet of experts who can begin lifting Lebanon out of its economic crisis with a dream of past glory. Other groups, including Hezbollah, want another direction which could make things even worse. Hezbollah's accumulation of dangerous weapons, smuggling, and other illicit and corrupt activities undermine legitimate state institutions. They rob the Lebanese of the ability to build a peaceful and prosperous country. And it's Iran that is fueling and financing this challenge to the state and this distortion of Lebanese political life. Middle East expert Dr. Mordecai Kadar says a complicating factor is the growing desire for the army to step in and save the country. The problem, Hezbollah is stronger than the army and has its people throughout the army's ranks from top to bottom. An organization which actually is a terror organization, now many people expect 
that Chivalawi take the country in order to feed the people, in order to bring some remedy. Kadar says in addition to military power, Hezbollah has become an economic power as well. Hezbollah is an economic empire because Hezbollah has hundreds of companies in Iraq, in Syria, and they deal with everything, with oil and infrastructure and construction. And, 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 and transportation. Ironically, Hezbollah gets the blame for Lebanon's most recent decline. Hezbollah definitely brought Lebanon to the abyss, and now everybody expects Hezbollah to save Lebanon from falling into the abyss. So uh, this is some kind of ambiguity, but there is nobody who can replace Hezbollah, and there is nobody who can chase Hezbollah out. But Professor Shaul Horev of the Haifa Maritime and Policy Research Center sees a possible ray of hope. That's because of ongoing talks between Israel and Lebanon over maritime boundaries. Horev believes an agreement between the two countries could keep Hezbollah in check. When we'll reach such an agreement, it will signal to the international companies who are dealing with exploration of gas fields and development of gas fields, that this area is stable. It will improve Lebanon's condition and it will signal the people in Lebanon that confrontation with Israel is not giving them any edge. Qadar, however, doesn't see much chance of derailing Hezbollah, especially with Israel as part of the solution. First of all, you have to get rid of Hezbollah, and Hezbollah is a very powerful army. You don't mess with such an army. Secondly, don't forget that Israel once tried to install new order in Lebanon in 1982, and Israel failed. Today, it is much harder. And Iran couldn't be happier. Hezbollah takes Lebanon over. This is actually a fulfillment of an Iranian dream that their proxy will not only be a military issue, but it will also become a state. And this is a major success for the, for the Mullah regime in Iran. And with more than 150,000 Hezbollah rockets aimed at Israel, such a scenario wouldn't be good for the Jewish state either. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. A rare archaeological find uncovered in the city of David hints at Roman life in Jerusalem after the destruction of the second Jewish temple. This is the pilgrim's path that led from the Pool of Siloam to the Temple Mount during the time of Jesus. After the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the Romans still guarded this path so they could access the water in the pool. It's in one of their buildings that archaeologists found a treasure. We started excavating the structure and within one of the walls of the structure we found half of a bronze oil lamp in the form of a theater mask. Israel Antiquities Authority archaeologist Ari Levy, who leads the excavation along the pilgrim's path, said the half lamp is shaped like a grotesque face and is cut in half. The lamp itself was inserted to the wall of the structure as a foundation deposit in order to give luck and to protect the structure itself and the people that lived within the structure. Levy said the lamp could be filled with oil and lit, but it's rare because it's made as a half lamp and they didn't find the other half. You can theoretically take the other half, connect it, and it will appear as a full face, or you can put it on a wall just this F and to light it. Levy said it shows the significance of the structure. It's very symbolic, the shape itself and also the location where it was found. The people that lived there needed the water, but they needed to protect the way to the water. It's very exciting. You do not find a, a find like this every day, not every year, not every decade. It's, a, it's like a one-time occasion. He said they have uncovered about 120 feet of the Roman building, and they'll keep digging, hoping maybe to find the other half of the lamp. Julie Stahl, CBN News, along the pilgrim's path in the city of David, Jerusalem. For Muslims around the world, this is the holy month of Ramadan. It's also the focus of a prayer effort to pray for Muslims. Wendy Griffith explains. Former Muslims are sharing their stories of discovering Jesus 
and praying that others will have the same experience. Once you have Jesus in your life, it, it just changes everything. Nadine, Afshin, and Yazra talk about growing up Muslim and finding the truth during the week-long outreach, Jesus and Ramadan. He's not a mad, angry God who created me, but he's mad at me. He's not that. He created me with so much love. Tom Doyle of Uncharted Ministries says the Muslim background believers will take questions and pray, not just for Muslims, but for Christians to learn how to share the gospel with them. We're going to have Emily from your team in Jerusalem and Josh from our team here in Dallas asking them questions. How did they find Christ in Iran, in Baghdad, Iraq, and, and uh, sharing their stories? And then they're going to give a call to action to believers in the West on how to reach out to Muslims. Why is it important to do this during the Islamic holy month of Ramadan? Yeah, you know that last week is the most special week during Ramadan because there's what we call, what they Muslims call the night of destiny, the night of power, where they just cry out to God. Do you know, Wendy, that is the number one night of the year that Jesus appears to Muslims in dreams. So they're searching for God and Jesus accommodates that request, but they're shocked and they're surprised when a man in a white robe comes and tells them that he loves them and he died for them on the cross. Jesus in Ramadan airs May 8th through 13th on CBN and unchartered social media platforms. Wendy Griffith, CBN News. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blasts so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline. On Jerusalem Dateline.